I want to actually read Psalm 1 with you, and, uh, and then I want to pray for today's activities. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. The big difference between those two people is the law of the Lord, right? The Word of God. And that is what we are here discussing this weekend at the Sacred Words Conference. Let me pray for us. Our Father and our God, we thank you for your grace and mercy poured out in our lives in your Son, Christ Jesus. He hung on a tree bearing your curse that was due to us. And you did not leave us in the dark to interpret all the events of your mighty salvation, but you supplied the interpretation of all of these events in your precious word. And it is that word that we are discussing here this morning. And I pray for our speakers that you give them uh, ease of speech. I pray more for the audience and the listeners that you would give us ears to hear and that we would have minds to think through uh, the truths that will be coming our way this morning. Bless all of our events, I pray, and may we say and do only that which honors you, O God. It's in Christ's name that I pray it. Amen. Please allow me to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Stephen Dempster. Dr. Dempster is professor of religious studies at Crandall University in Moncton. I don't know if I pronounced that right. New Brunswick. So he's definitely from east of the Mississippi River. From 2011 to 2016, Dr. Dempster served as chair of the Biblical Theology section for the Evangelical Theological Society. He's the author of Dominion and Dynasty, a theology of the Hebrew Bible, and has also just written a commentary on Micah. So he is an Old Testament scholar and commentator for sure. But Steve is also a humble man who has helped me personally, think through many difficult theological questions over the years, not only in his writings, but also through many emails. And so I'm very thankful to you, Steve, for your, your, your help to me and in your writings to many, many others. And I'm glad to have him here to speak on the Old Testament canon this morning. So please help me welcome Dr. Dempster to the stage. It's a real, uh, it's a real pri privilege to be here and an honor to be invited uh, to be among such august uh, scholars. Um, and um, I, uh, I, and it's, it's actually a great treat because when I left the other day, uh, Thursday morning, it was 20 below. <laughs> and so I had my big overcoat on and when I got here, I just needed a t-shirt. So it's been wonderful, um, a paradise. So, um, how did the Bible become the Bible? And, uh, and I've just uh, given a subtitle from smoking gun to smoking cannon to burning hearts. Uh, but just let me uh, point out that, uh, now it's, no, 
it's, it's not working on my screen, but it's working there. Uh, just, uh, just to point, I'm, when I talk about the Bible, I'm an Old Testament scholar, so that's going to be my interest here when I talk about the Bible. The first, actually, three quarters of the Christian Bible is the Old Testament, uh, 77%. So uh, I always tell my students, uh, not to know the Old Testament would be like reading um, the, uh, the third volume of Lord of the Rings, uh, The Return of the King, without reading uh, The Hobbit, without reading uh, The Fellowship of the Ring and The, uh, the Two Towers. Uh, it would be almost really impossible to understand. So, uh, so how, I'm dealing specifically with the Old Testament, and so that's your Old Testament there, and it consists of 17 books of history, five books of poetry, um, and are, which deal with the present, and then 17 books of prophecy at the end. And there's the Hebrew. Uh, I, I really do think this was the Bible of Jesus. This was the uh, Tanakh, and it's called uh, the Torah, the Nevi'im, the prophets, and the writings. And if you think of it as five, added by three, added by three. So you get, uh, these are the Hebrew names in the large print and the, some of the English names in the, um, in the small print. And so this is what we have, 24 books. So uh, let me begin with three quotes which reflect a crying need for a colloquium like this. The first is from a biblical scholar who wrote a text for students uh, at the turn of the millennium in 1998. After four chapters of setting the stage for her book, she concludes this major section as follows. We've proposed that there is no such thing as a Bible in terms of there being one coherent book, no such thing as a biblical theology in any uniform sense, no such thing as a biblical canon in the sense of one universally acknowledged collection of biblical books, no such thing as one standard biblical text. Then she writes what is perhaps the understatement of the millennium. Uh, quote, it may be that the conclusions of these first four chapters appear to be unduly pessimistic about the nature of the Bible, unquote. <laughs> the next quote is a, is a statement uh, by two biblical scholars, two American biblical scholars down here in the South, um, and they say this, the discipline of biblical studies lives and thrives today as never before. They conclude this article on this uh, uh, topic, rethinking the concept of the Bible. That is so, even though the Bible does not exist, if it, by that we mean a canonically and textually defined entity held in common by all interpreters throughout the ages. There are only Bibles, they all include texts which exhibit a great deal of diversity in their family history. Now, uh, the Academy uh, filters down into the popular world and uh, this is a quote I got from the internet when uh, uh, a, a week or two ago because uh, this was put up and I responded to it actually by uh, uh, um, a particular person that was on Facebook. And um, this is what he says. Back when the Bible was written, then edited, then rewritten, then rewritten, then re-edited, then translated from dead languages, then retranslated, um, and then edited, then rewritten, then given to kings for them to take their favorite parts, then rewritten, then rewritten, then translated again to give to the Pope for him to approve, then rewritten, then translated, then re 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 rewritten -re -re again, all based on stories that were told 30 to 90 years after they had happened to people who didn't know how to write. So, and you can fill in the dots. Uh, when I responded to his, uh, to this, um, this, this person's um, posting, I just said, by the way, you know, the Bible um, was one of the first books that was burned, actually. And Jeremiah's prophecy was burned by a king. Kings don't like them, actually. <laughs> they don't like them because it reminds them who they are. They're put in their place. Well, these quotes stretch credulity given the fact that millions of people down through the centuries today have ordered their lives by something that doesn't exist. We shouldn't ex expect complete and utter unanimity about some of these things, but we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Roger Beckwith has warned us about expecting a Bible agreed upon by everyone. If it means a situation 
where such unanimity about the identity of the books has been achieved so that no individual ever again questions the right of them to its place in the Bible, the canon of neither testament has never been closed, either among Jews or Christians. True, we also don't have the original copies, but it seems that what we have is better than a huge smoking gun. Uh, this is a phrase that I've been thinking about a lot lately. It comes from police investigations, and it refers to incontrovertible evidence that for a crime or a fact, despite direct eyewitness, uh, the absence of direct eyewitness evidence. Do you remember when the Arab journalist for the Washington Post went to the Saudi embassy in Turkey to get his passport updated? He never left alive, and after an investigation, a U.S. senator was briefed, and he said, it was absolutely clear that Jamal Khashoggi was murdered. He said that there may have been no smoking gun, but there was a smoking saw. Well, first, as Peter showed last night, the transmission of the text does not necessarily mean distortion, as it is clear that there has one, been one important text type that has been preserved for all intents and purposes from pre-Christian times. And his point about apparent diversity during those pre-Christian times does not mean lack of consensus or lack of fidelity. There was concern for both repetition and resignification, and you have to distinguish between the two. Well, what is the nature of the Bible, or as theologians often call it, the canon? All of this points to a body of literature that was regarded as absolutely important, indispensable for living and learning because it had absolute divine authority. This is what the word Bible comes to mean. We come to use it as it's, it's, it's taken from a religious context and used in secular ways. So we have... Uh, different types of Bibles. Uh, we have the Bible for chefs, the Bible for sports enthusiasts, the Bible for educators, a bird watcher's Bible. This shows the pervasive influence of this term, and it clearly means here the authoritative guide to whatever discipline it is used to describe. The Bible is simply derived from the word biblia in Greek, which simply means books. And it was first applied as a title to the books of the Torah, the Pentateuch, which were translated from the Hebrew into Greek in Alexandria in the 3rd century B.C. These were simply called the books in a letter describing the production of the Septuagint a hundred or so years later, the letter of Aristeus. Uh, these books were recognized as the oracles of God. Uh, they became known, this became known as the first edition of the Septuagint, which we were talking about last night, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. They were not just books, they were the books. And it was the Christian preacher, John Chrysostom, uh, who first used the term to describe the combination of Old and New Testaments together in his homilies on Matthew around 388 A.D., Shortly thereafter, in medieval times, the Latin word biblia, which can be both plural and singular, was used. By that time, all the books of the Bible could be contained in one volume, a so-called pandect. It became logical to view the word as singular, the book. But make no mistake about it, this literature was unique. It was regarded as divine revelation. But it was not dropped by the sky and written on by the finger of God. That happened perhaps only in the first instance. But it was first proclaimed by people who had inspiration from God and then who faithfully transferred that oral proclamation into writing. Most of these people at a later time could be called prophets. God inspired them so that they could see or hear what they could not normally see or hear. Uh, what he then would do is he would reveal it, and their inspiration also extended not only to reception, but to communication as well. Uh, they did not always understand what they were saying, but they faithfully communicated it. Later, their words were recorded, and the literature was therefore regarded as 
uh, inspired as different from ordinary speech or writing. It was not made any different by some council or group or power brokers who decided for themselves what books were in and what books were out a la Dan Brown and his theory in the Da Vinci Code or as you read in popular literature about the canon. The term that is given to this uh, uh, material is in fact uh, canon. Uh, this term was first used in 367 AD in a famous letter of Athanasius uh, when he describes uh, the books that are canonical as divinely inspired. Uh, the term is co first coined to indicate a collection of divinely inspired literature and the concept of such a collection can be traced back much further. Well, then let's just see how much further, <laughs> okay? And what, what, this, what we have with this concept of canon. Some argue that uh, since the word uh, only appears in the fourth century, then the idea um, didn't exist. Well, that's kind of like saying, um, it's interesting, the word religion never appears in any uh, um, ancient uh, ideas of what we'd call religion today, but yet to say that the ancient world wasn't religious is absolutely uh, incredible. And, and uh, I would say simply, you know, um, even though we may not have a word and we coin it later, um, it's still a reality. Uh, if it walks like a duck, it talks like a duck, it's a duck, even though we may not have that word, the duck. That there was an authoritative collection of literature from pre-Christian times can be shown by considering a number of pieces of evidence besides the obvious evidence that Peter considered last night, the textual witnesses to an authoritative collection. Because make no mistake about it, the idea of an absolutely authoritative written communication from God's demands, uh, from God demands an infrastructure that supports it that is a center that is devoted to storing, producing, and copying these texts. After all, these texts are the word of God. Canon implies the importance of faithful textual transmission, and we saw that last night. But I'm just going to look at some other evidences besides the idea of textual transmission. The evidence for canon is found in the following. First ex example, the Mishnah is a compilation of rabbinical uh, tradition about how to apply the Torah and the scriptures to the life of the Jews. Um, it is a collection of the oral traditions of the rabbis from the first century AD to around 200 AD, and it was written down shortly thereafter by someone called Rabbi Judah, who must have had an amazing memory, and he wrote all of this down. It largely consists of rabbinical oral tradition, which is called in the New Testament, the traditions of the elders. It is entire reason for existence is to seek to apply uh, absolutely authoritative writings to the faithful living in later times. It is sometimes called the oral Torah, and for Jews it was viewed in many ways as on par with the written Torah. But having said that, it bears witness to uh, just the same to a body of authoritative literature, literature that for Jews was so holy that paradoxically they called this literature that, that literature which or the books which defile the hands, which probably was a backhanded way of imparting sanctity to these books. Uh, if, if people had to wash their ta hands every time they touched them, they would simply not treat them casually. The simple formula used by the authorities recorded in the Mishnah when the rabbis wanted to supply authority for a statement was this, and it, uh, thus it, it is said, as it is said, as it is said, very much like in the New Testament it is written. As Peter Pettit has remarked, and he did his PhD thesis on the use of such quotations in the Mish Mishnah, such a statement is a lightning rod, quote, explicitly alerting the reader to their, the rabbi's reliance on a prior discourse uh, to advance their own, unquote. That prior discourse is a collection of authoritative literature 
and it remarkably squares with, with, with what we have come to know as the Jewish Bible, the Tanakh. There are no citations of any other literature when this formula is used other than the books that we have in the Tanakh. Only Daniel is not cited with this formula, but it is clear that it's pre, it is regarded as canonical because they say it in another portion in the book or in the, the Mishnah. The stats are as follows. Um, and this is my own, as I've gone through this and looked at every example of she, the Amar, this is what you have. You have from the Torah, obviously very, very important. You have 381 references with this term, 68.5%. Uh, from the prophets, 85, 15.3%. And from the writings, 90 and 16.2%. Now, um, there's even a citation from the Mishnaic time period that was not found in the Mishnah, but was preserved in the Talmud. This is called a baraita, and it means that which is external to the, to the Mishnah, but part of that uh, period. Uh, so this baraita um, is, um, basically says this. Um, it says the order of, it's assumed that the... Um, that the Torah is there. And then it says, it, is, it says, our rabbis taught. And this shows you its oral tradition from the period of the rabbis. The order of the prophets is Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, and the 12 minor prophets. The order of the writings is Ruth and the book of Psalms and Job and Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs and Lamentations, Daniel, the scroll of Esther, Ezra, meaning Ezra, Nehemiah, and Chronicles. Here the canon consists of three parts, and the number is 24. All I would say is this. Um, it would seem to me that the evidence from the Mishnaic period supplies not only a smoking gun, but a smoking cannon. <laughs> the second piece of evidence is the writing of Jews from the first century, and if we include... Uh, um, uh, Luke, who is Gentile, Jews and one Gentile, okay? Uh, the first one being the New Testament. It is impossible to understand the early Christian church without an understanding of a body of literature to which it abs as as ascribed absolute authority. It is a literature which presumes not just a smoking gun, but a smoking cannon. This is what I find so hard to understand about a form, of Christ, a form of Christianity which seeks to unhitch itself from the Old Testament. It is impossible. As Jack Miles, and I'm no fan of him as a, as a scholar or a theologian, but I've learned a lot from him, uh, he says about the relation of the New Testament to the Old. The New Testament is like a skin upon which every square inch of the Old Testament is tattooed. The gospel writers particularly cannot move a muscle without bringing some portion of the Hebrew scriptures into view. The assumption everywhere is that there is a settled collection of literature to which the Messiah, Jesus, supplies the key for interpretation. His whole life, from beginning to end, is saturated with Old Testament scripture. His messianic birth is verified by him being born in Bethlehem, which was predicted by the prophet Micah. His name is called Emmanuel based on the word of the prophet Isaiah. When he is baptized at the Jordan, he gets his identity card from the three parts of the Hebrew Bible. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Beloved comes from Genesis 22, when a Isaac, of course, is the beloved one of Abraham. Um, and this is my son comes from Psalm 2, the writings. So we have the Torah, the writings, and also the... Uh, the prophet Isaiah speaks of the servant of Yahweh who will bring his justice to the nations. And he is the one in, who says, my, behold, my elect one in whom my soul delights. So from the three parts of the, uh, of the Hebrew Bible, Jesus gets his identity card. Um, it's almost like um, if you think of Cinderella, uh, the Old Testament pr provides the shoe for her to put on. Jesus can put on that shoe. Um, so, uh, 
And Jesus, after this, when he's driven to the desert for 40 days, where he succeeds against the tempter by citing to him scripture repeatedly, the only extra biblical words he uses is, it is written, it is written, it is written. Uh, so he says uh, to Satan, who tells him to use miraculous powers to feed himself, if he's the son of God, he says, it is written, human beings do not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceeds from the mouth of God. When Satan urges him to test God's willingness to save him by jumping down from the temple mount, he says, it is written, you shall not test the Lord your God. Finally, when Satan offers him all the kingdoms of the world, he says to him, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. The only other word he asks is, it says, is depart from me, Satan. So these all come from Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 8, verse 3. Deuteronomy 6, verse 13. Deuteronomy 6, verse 16. In many ways, this is Jesus' favorite book as far as we know from his citations from the Old Testament. Then when Jesus begins his mission and announces his mission statement in his hometown at Nazareth, he reads from Isaiah 61 and says, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Throughout his ministry, there's a constant, conscious use of scripture repeatedly. He is either fulfilling it or arguing from it. In debates with opponents, Jesus and the early Christian missionaries cite this literature and it settles the matter. It is written, enough said. Uh, debates with opponents are never about the extent of the canon or the words of the canon, but the interpretation of its content. Early Christianity was born with a Bible in its hands and like the Mishnah, here are the stats. So this is, these are quotes with citation formulas from the New Testament where you have 98 from the Torah, 81 from the prophets, and 74 from the writings. The only books that aren't cited here are Joshua, Judges from the prophets, and Ruth, Ecclesiastes, Esther, Song of Songs, and Nehemiah and Ezra, uh, Ezra slash Nehemiah from the writings. Uh, moreover, the only books that don't quote the Tanakh are Philemon, 2nd and 3rd John, and Revelation. But in the latter's defense, it contains allusions to the Old Testament almost in every paragraph. Having said this, I need to point out that the New Testament does seem to cite a book not in the Old Testament authoritatively, uh, um, but I would understand that as citing a source from one of these books who spoke prophetically, Enoch. In my judgment, if one wishes to see this as an exception, it proves the rule. And it is also the case that sometimes the quotation formula is used for a text we're not absolutely certain where that text comes from in the Old Testament so, so that the passage uh, Jesus will be called... Uh, uh, um, it says that in fulfillment of the prophet prophecy, uh, Jesus, he, w he was from Nazareth and he would be called a Nazarene. And, but it's possible to understand that possibly from, we don't have a passage in the Old Testament, but there may be an allusion to the fact in Isaiah chapter 11, we have the idea of uh, Jesus innate, or the, a shoot coming up from the, the stump of Jesse. So this is the New Testament, and again, we're dealing with a, a body of literature which is absolutely authoritative. And I wanted to take a look at two more examples from the first century. There are two traditions about enumerations of the books and the extent of the canon, both coming from the end of the first century. There is a tradition that Ezra, this is a sort of a diagram of him or a picture, published 94 books and 70 of them were to be read in private and 24 were to be used in public. I often ask my students which are the most important books and they almost automatically say the ones to be read in private because we're from such an individualistic culture, but it's the opposite. Um, now, it's clear that I think the author of 4th Ezra is trying to argue for a more inclusive canon, but he recognizes the default position. There is a canon of 24 books 
uh, and he's trying to, uh, to argue in some ways against it, but he acknowledges it um, just the same. Uh, so uh, secondly, so we have this, this argument, but we also have Josephus in his defense of Judaism to the Greeks states that unlike the Greeks, the Jews do not have myriads of books, but only 22 which have been given for all time because they have been given by God. He further states that the time of revelation has ceased um, from the Persian period about 400 BC because of the failure of the exact succession of the prophets. And there you have, it, you have this statement. Uh, it's interesting that Joseph, Josephus' or, order is unique and it is arranged according to genre. But before dealing with the question of number 22 verses 24, Josephus says as plain as day that there has been for a considerable time a closed collection of books which have divine authority. None can be added to it because a period of prophetic inspiration has come to a close. This age of revelation that is an unbroken succession is over. Um, it is interesting, you know, a scholar uh, uh, dealing with it. I, I've written an article on Josephus as kind of the elephant in the room in this whole discussion of the, of the canon because he's very awkward in dealing with this whole issue. Uh, very awkward for people who deny the idea of a canon until later times. Um, but, uh, but, but, but one of the, what, what is the issue then about 22 verses 24? This seems an obvious contradiction with the number of 24 previously mentioned, but the following should be taken into consideration. Both Origen and Jerome uh, mentioned that there was a tradition among the Jews of a 22-book canon by combining Judges with Ruth and Lamentations with Jeremiah. And uh, so, and they also argue that it's based, these later uh, um, authors, that it's based on the alphabet, although Josephus doesn't mention that. Uh, the Hebrew alphabet has 22 letters. Um, I just, I'm, I am wrestling through with this question, it, but it's clear it's the same material, okay? My own feeling is, uh, well, I go back and forth on this uh, in terms of the, the actual uh, issue. Is this an idiosyncratic, um, his, his actual listing of the books? Is this idiosyncratic or is this uh, something that was known by all Jews? Anyway, um, um, just, uh, let's, I, I just want to uh, deal with one more, uh, one more particular piece of evidence. I have some others, but I, I, I don't have the time to deal with it. Um, that is... This, the plethora of pseudonymity. Okay, the plethora of pseudonymity. Um, these are books taken from uh, James Charlesworth's two volume book on the pseudepigrapha. Well, it is clearly known that there was a vast variety of literature during this period which was written and was not included in this authoritative collection. A myriad of books were written under pseudonyms. Uh, Apocalypse of Adam, Apocalypse of Abraham, Apocalypse of Elijah, First to Third Enoch, Testament of Moses, Fourth Ezra, Joseph, and Asenath, Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs, etc. While there may be reasons for the use of synonyms, many reasons for the use of pseudonyms, the most reasonable explanation is to secure canonical authority for the literature by dating it to a period during the exact succession of the prophets. Now, you can't get any earlier than Adam, okay, or Enoch, okay. Uh, this clearly shows, it's, it's evidence that the canon had to have been established earlier. Many of the authors of these books were using the names of people who lived during a period of divine revelation when prophecy was alive and well. This was their way of trying to make the canonical cut and fool people. Uh, since such people that they name, if they wrote it, could have definitely been inspired. But this vast variety of literature written under these pseudonyms is another smoking gun. It's telling, the smoking canon as far as I'm concerned, it's telling that the only book uh, that fooled everyone 
was Daniel. <laughs> okay, and I, and I find that's telling. I don't believe that at all. And so, uh, so we've looked at some evidence for canon. What about the reason for canon and criteria for inclusion? Well, it has been demonstrated that there is a clear body of literature which is defined as inspired by God, and it's clear that it had to derive from a certain epoch when God inspired people with his words. What is the reason then for canon? What is the reason for God's communication written down in permanent form? Well, it's obvious that communication does not require writing and written text. Uh, I've got a written text here, but I'm actually communicating orally. Our primary way is to communicate is with speech, oral forms of discourse, but there are other ways to communicate, such as nonverbal signs. And in the biblical text, prophets often used nonverbal signs to communicate. One only has to think of Jeremiah smashing pots or Ezekiel burrowing a hole through a wall. Um, or Hosea marrying um, someone that uh, was a bit risque, okay. Um, but one distinctive of both Judaism and Christianity is that God is a speaking God. Thus, it is fitting that the Bible, which is the record of God's speech, to us begins with God speaking. He speaks and the chaos, uh, chaos and uh, darkness are banished. Researchers on narrative style in Hebrew literature show the importance of speech and dialogue in Hebrew narrative. And when a character first enters a story, their first speech is often revelatory of their divine character or of their character. So, for example, think of two, two uh, beings. God's first speech is, and let there be light. And there was light. That's indicative of his character. He's a God who wants to shed light, who wants to make people flourish, to make the world flourish. Think of the first words of the serpent who is introduced. Has God really said, you shall not eat from any of the trees of the garden? It's relevatory of his, of his character. That's what we're dealing with. Um, and as the Bible continues... It is clear that God's speech is absolutely central to the flourishing of human life. His speech is found in nonverbal ways through the surrounding creation which he makes with his speech, but it's absolutely necessary also for that first couple to have a, a, a verbal revelation to make sense of it all. In other words, that verbal revelation is necessary for them to give them their task, and also to give them their boundaries. Without it, um, they, they are lost in many ways. The failure to live life by this interpretation that God gives, this verbal revelation, results in humanity living in death and in darkness. But the God of grace continues to speak, calling out in auditions, their dreams, visions to special people in order to bring light again uh, into human lives and to teach them that humanity does not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Throughout Genesis, we see this happening, the word of God occurring this way, but with little concern in many ways for a written revelation. God does not communicate to Abraham or the patriarchs on clay tablets or papyrus, but in other forms. But as the family of Israel with whom God has made a covenant grows into a nation, things begin to change. There is clear development as for the first time God, as, as God actually begins to actually live with the people in the form of a tabernacle. He's dwelling with them. He's at home with them. And this visible structure of his divine presence is accompanied by a document which inscribes his will and is a sign of the covenant. This is the Sinai covenant when God addresses the people from the top of the mountain in direct speech. Uh, but with the building of the tabernacle uh, and the recording of his speech on two documents carved in stone, uh, a copy for him and a copy for his covenant partner, 
deposited in a receptacle which serves as the footstool to the invisible throne of God in the inner sanctum of the tabernacle, God takes up residence in Israel as the divine king. And so in a sense, this is what we have. This is the holy of holies. This is the the inner sanctum. And the 10 words are right in here. This is the place of enthronement. The invisible throne, this is the footstool of the invisible throne of the divine king who is now taking up residence uh, among his people, the people of Israel. Um, God takes up residence here as a divine king. Thus the tabernacle, complete with the documents, becomes a kind of portable Sinai. Why was the divine will written by the very finger of God we read? to show for all time the permanence of a covenant, a record of the covenant and the accuracy of God's will for future generations. In addition, Moses presented the people with a book called the Book of the Covenant with additional stipulations. It is significant that the 10 words were placed in the receptacle representing the visible footstool of the divine throne. In the, uh, the Book of the Covenant was most surely placed nearby Here was Israel's first Bible, and it was written by God himself, and and its canonical stature is shown by its conspicuous presence at the heart of sacred space. Um, This is in many ways the beginning of the kingdom of God uh, in, uh, in the Old Testament. Now, by being written down and recording these words for future generations, God would not need to reinvent the wheel of Sinai for every generation. It was there as a permanent record, and Israel could live into it. Thus, it is clear that here at Sinai, we have the genesis of the Bible as a written document. It is, as Meredith Klein has called, a nuclear canon. At this stage, it might be helpful to consider what is happening in Israel in the context of ancient history. First of all, the Bible consists of written language, mostly in Hebrew. It's worth noting in any the importance of the invention of the alphabet, without which the Bible would not be in the form it is in today. One needs to ponder the revolution of the alphabet for a minute. It was absolutely an incredible breakthrough, uh, and we're all uh, heirs to this breakthrough right now uh, as we sit and as I read, actually, my text. um, This was a revolution of stupendous consequences. Writing had been around since 3000 BC in Sumer and shortly after in Egypt, but it consisted of hundreds of symbols that only a small class of elites could memorize and utilize Um, and become proficient using. But with the invention of the alphabet over a thousand years later, probably in the area of Sinai by Semitic slaves, all the sounds of speech could now be reduced to 22 symbols. It now means greater access for many more people to become literate than just an elite few. While some scholars, like the late William Foxwell Albright, might exaggerate the proliferation of literacy and its ramification with his statement that even a mere schoolboy can learn 22 letters in a few days, the point is to be made. That the invention of the alphabet makes at least the democratization of literacy at least possible. And with the discovery of an ABC degree, and there's been a number of these, like an alphabet, uh, written on a st- stone found in, uh, in uh, the, uh, a village in southwest Israel named Tel Zayat in 2008, um, this suggests that people, even in the countryside, were learning to write and to read. I mean, why would you write down an alphabet in a home on a piece of rock? Well... Um, the only place you usually see alphabets is, uh, we know, in grade one, uh, with those big letters that are around the, the, the top of the, uh, the wall. Um, and I remember asking someone who's very skeptical of any kind of literacy in the ancient world, uh, a renowned scholar, uh, what this means. And he said to me, it means that someone in the ninth century knew the alphabet. Uh, and I just... 
struggle to deal with that. That's what we, that is true. That is true. But why would you write the alphabet down? Um, um, anyway, it also means, the alphabet means more text can be potentially produced. But moreover, writing itself means you can transcend um, space and time. You don't have to be personally present to convey your message. It can be sent to a different destination without your presence, and it can speak to a person a thousand years after you are dead. Oral messages sent out are de can be very unreliable and subject to change and distortion, but the likelihood of that is greatly lessened with writing. So the genesis of the Bible then takes place in the midst of an epistemological and social revolution as well as a religious one, and I'm thinking of the re uh, revolution of monotheism. The God of the universe begins to make himself known in texts. And one, as one of my esteemed mentors and uh, Peter's mentors once remarked, the gods of all their other nations revealed themselves in images, but Israel found her God in the text. This surely provided an additional theological motivation for literacy in Israel. A generation after Sinai, Moses and the people are on the verge of entering the promised land. So Moses gives Israel his swan song before they enter the land. This takes the form of a covenant renewal speech, which he presents to them on the plains of Moab, and after which he writes it down probably on a papyrus scroll. In this document, he summarizes the Sinai covenant, adapts it for life, in Canaan, revises it and tries to capture its essence, which is to love God with all one's heart, with all one's soul, and with all one's strength. It is the equivalent in some ways of the Old Testament Sermon on the Mount, or perhaps Jesus' upper room discourse before his death. Moses makes provision for the people that they won't forget this document by urging them to have a public proclamation of its content to the entire nation, uh, to be reminded of its identity and vocation. To that end, it is entrusted to Levitical priests who will safeguard it near the ark and the sanctuary along with other documents which could be there. Moreover, it's not just the people as a whole who are to listen to this being read. And it's notice they are to, it would take a few hours to read it. Uh, they'd have to probably stand, and we see that happening in the book of Ezra when they return. Um, but it's done once every seven years. Now, to read the Bible once every seven years is, uh, doesn't really seem to impress it very much upon you. Uh, it would be easy to forget the contents uh, as if it was dusted off every seven years and read once. Thus, this must have been regarded as a covenant renewal ceremony, much like the renewing of one's wedding vows. But it's expected that each family and its members will commit some of the contents of this to memory and that they will distill the essence of it day and night into their lives. Thus, in the Shema, there is a call for every Israelite to hear about God's uniqueness, commit to love him with all one's heart, soul, and strength, and put the, ones, uh, the words of the Torah on one's heart. Uh, repeat them to their children at home or on a journey during the entire day. So we have Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, um, uh, Adonai Akkad, Vahavta, Eit Adonai Eloheka, Bakol Lavavka, Avkol Nafshaka, Uvkol Maodeka, etc., etc., etc. And thus they may, must make, take measures to ensure this happens. They must bind them as a sign on their hands in order to motivate action and place them as a band between their eyes to inspire vision. And get this, they are to keep the memory alive by writing the words on the doorposts of their home um, and uh, in many ways and on their gates. This is probably a functional literacy, but it's meaningless. I mean, they're not going to write the whole Torah out there, but they're going to write some things from the Torah to remind them of their identity and who they serve. Uh, but it's meaningless, this functional literacy is meaningless if people in the home cannot read and write. And it's meaningless if there is not some exemplar copy of this document. But this literacy is demanded because of the importance of the written word. Uh, it is the word of the living God. Now, I just want to show you an example from the ancient world where a part of the Torah was actually written on an amulet that was probably around someone's neck. She took this to the grave with her, and this was discovered in, uh, 
a, a few, uh, I think a few decades ago, and it is actually, it's called the Ketav Hinnom Scroll. So it's a little amulet, and they were able to take it apart, and that's what it says, and it's from number six. Now, tell me about this. It, the, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. This is the word of God. This is the oldest text that we have of the Bible actually in situ. Uh, and it comes from Numbers. Now, a lot of people saw, thought that this text from Numbers was written after 625 B.C. Well, here, uh, smoking gun, smoking cannon for the material that we have here. But it, this is striking, it seems to me, of the word of the living God around someone in a graveyard. In other words, Yahweh, even in death, is going to bless me. Um, finally, uh, this takes a more striking example in the leader, a prospective king. In addition to being restricted in a number of behaviors, he must take his orders from the real king of Israel and go to the Levitical priests and why in their presence write out for himself a copy of the Torah. Why? So that he might have a personal copy of the Torah and read from it every day in order to worship Yahweh and to have a humble heart of service towards its fellow Israelites, ensuring that he obeys all its instructions. Here it's clear that the king has to be more than functionally literate. But notice the clear implication. He gets his original copy from which he writes his own copy from priests who are responsible for safeguarding, preserving, and transmitting it. Here it is clear that not only a hearing culture is developing, but one that is a reading and writing culture, and it's not extrinsic to the faith, but is intrinsic. Now, what about expanding the canon? We have the Torah, we have the Ten Commands, we have the, uh, the Book of the Covenant, we have, the, we have, an, we have a growing canon, okay? Uh, before Moses dies, he establishes a prophetic institution that will carry on the proclamation of the divine will so that Sinai can be continued. That is the further revelation of the divine will. They are especially recognized, these people, these prophets, as authoritative by two features. Their words must conform to the covenant already given, and when they make predictions, they must come true. So here is a provision for future revelation from God through this institution and expanded canon. Indeed, a generation after Moses, Joshua renews the covenant with the people in the land. He writes the words of the Torah on an altar, or some of them, and then he records the renewal, the, the renewal of the covenant in the book of the Torah of God at the end of Joshua 24, which is placed near a sanctuary in Shechem. The authoritative literature is expanding. In the historical accounts that we have in the Bible, which follow Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings, Israel is constantly forgetting the covenant. There are numerous accounts of prophets arising and setting Israel straight for this. They are constantly called back to the covenant. There are about 25 predictions and fulfillments in this literature which show the importance and the power of prophecy. Later, entire collections of prophetic speeches are gathered and recorded because these people were regarded as speaking the word of God in line with Moses. To each of these prophetic collections, titles were added. The words of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw. The words of Amos, the shepherd of Tekoa, two years before the earthquake. The vision of Nahum of Alkosh. Gene Tucker writes about these superscriptions which have been added to the prophetic speeches to confirm their divine authority. The specific intentions of the prophetic superscriptions, he says, are reflected above all in the particular vocabulary used to classify these books. The basic concern behind the language is the theological problem of authority and revelation. Thus, the fundamental intention of the superscriptions is to identify the prophetic books as the word of God. What had originally been claimed by the prophets for their individual oral addresses is now claimed for their words written down to be copied, read, and therefore to live for future generations. Thus, we have another collection being added to the Mosaic Torah, which is prophetic authority. But what about some of the books such as Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Job? Some of these books have been uh, writings that are very early and even earlier than material in the prophets. Uh, in Israelite epistemology, there was not only the idea of revelation through prophetic insight, 
such as God speaking to a person through a dream or vision or uh, audition. But there was also the idea of God speaking through creation in a clear way so that you order your life on the basis of his word coming through in creation. Thus, God gives the ability to see things clearly and an ability to reason to a sound conclusion. This is what is called the gift of hokmah, the gift of wisdom. Thus, for example, you re, do you remember when God was choosing a king for Israel? He told Samuel to go to Jesse's house to anoint the next king. Uh, and uh, how did Samuel know who was the right choice? He thought on the basis of his own authority that it was this person, this person, this person. And it was finally God said, no, 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 this one. God, he heard the voice of God in his head. Samuel was a prophet and he listened to God speak a revelation inside his head. But do you remember when Solomon was confronted with a choice, the choice about who the mother was of the living baby? He devised a test and was able to reach the right conclusion with all the certainty of a prophet. How? He listened to the word of God in creation because he had the gift of wisdom. He saw the real mother's reaction to his solution and included that she had to be the real mother. Now, this is a different epistemology than that of a prophet, but it is no less valid. How do the sages operate? Thus, for example, the Torah reveals the command directly from Sinai, do not commit adultery. The sage never uses that command to teach, but he does look at the results of adultery in real life and concludes that to embark on such behavior is to die and just read Proverbs chapter 7. Thus, there is a provision for, and just look around you, actually. Thus, there is a provision for another collection of written texts which gives divine insight through the gift of extraordinary wisdom. The wisdom reinforces the prophets in the Torah and sometimes expands on their meaning. Thus, Daniel in exile is reflecting on the prophetic books and wondering what has happened to Jeremiah's prediction that the exile will last 70 years. He is kind of given a revelatory insight that the 70 years really means 70 weeks of years. Now, many of the Psalms are addressing God because of what he has already said in the Torah and the Prophets. Think of Psalm 119, in which there are eight different terms for the word of God given in the Torah. It presumes a deep meditation on these words. The psalmist asks for wisdom constantly uh, in being able to understand these words that he sees in front of him on a page. Open my eyes that I might behold wonders out of your law. Cause me to understand your word so that I might live. I see it, but help me to understand it. May my mouth declare all the judgments of your mouth which are written in these texts. Chronicles, one of the last books uh, of the canon, the last book in my understanding, is written is nothing but an extended wisdom reflection on the entire canon of Scripture. What about updating and editing of the canon? We don't learn much about the preservation of these texts and the infrastructure that would have been in place for transmitting them and supplementing them. They are kept in the background, but we can glean some information through incidental means. We know that the texts were supplemented for later audiences, and Peter showed some of that last night. Um, but I'm thinking of within the canonical period. Uh, um, which goes to show the authority these texts had. In other words, they are being read. In other words, you will find places throughout the text which update them that sort of provide an updated version. John Salheimer uses the language of updated software to describe what happens. Thus, he speaks of a Pentateuch 1.0 and a Pentateuch 2.0 as the first version needed updating for a later audience. Well, let's just look at a few texts to indicate what this means, and we might be able to speak of a Genesis 1 and a Genesis 2. Um, for example, when Abraham enters the land, it mentions that the Canaanites were then in the land. Moses would not have written this because it was totally obvious to him and his audience. But the people were going into the land to the conquer the Canaanites, for goodness sake. But this information would have been added by a scribe who was informing his audience at a later time that the land was not Abraham's and that he was claiming it by faith because there were many people named Canaanites in the land. And you can see that in the text. 
Uh, this editorial parenthesis is for a later audience. Now let's look at another example from the book of Samuel. Um, here, there is an editor or scribe who adds a clarification to explain a word which is no longer used, a sort of updating of vocabulary. In this story, Saul and his servant have been looking for lost donkeys. Um, there's a clarification, and so he will, there'll be clarification. An, a, an editor will add material to clarify the situation. Saul feels that they've spent enough time searching, so they better return because his father will start worrying about a lost son instead of the lost animals. His servant says that there's maybe one last hope, and that is to go to a town nearby where, because there's a man of God who is a seer there who for a price can tell them where the donkeys are to be located. And so they have so, a little bit of money. They agree to go and meet some, and, so, and so they meet some women coming out of the town and ask them if they know where the seer is, and they tell him. Now, to an early audience reading this text or hearing it be read, there'd be no problem. But to a later audience, they require an explanation because the seer has fallen out of use. The word seer has fallen out of use. Who or what is a seer? What's going on? So a later editor explains what is nowadays called a pro prophet used to be called a seer. And so there you see, formerly in Israel, uh, if someone went to inquire of God, they would say, come, let us go and meet the seer. Um, now I just want to emphasize a few points. This shows the scrupulousness of the editor towards his sources. It would be very easy to su just substitute the word prophet, but the editor did not do that. Secondly, the fact that the editor is updating the material shows that the sources are written down, and it shows that they are being read and heard. They're important. They're important enough to be edited because they are in use, and their intelligent use requires explanation. These were not just timeless artifacts. Um, another example can be found in the book of Proverbs. Um, and Proverbs consists of collections of Proverbs, mainly from Solomon, 970 to 930 BC. But there existed at one time a number of separate collections of Proverbs. One of them was added to another collection during the time of Hezekiah, 715 to 687 BC, 200 years later. There are, these are more Proverbs of Solomon collected, copied by the scribes of Hezekiah of Judah. So there's the situation, you've got two collections, but one's added to the other one at a later time. Um, in, this, uh, in this example, the editors are not so much explaining the material, but they are bringing collections together and organizing them so that their audiences must hear the full counsel of God in matters of wisdom. So there's, uh, in, in matters of wisdom, they're springing these scriptures together. Um, so the same could be said for the book of Psalms, which existed in different stages, but is produced in a final form so that the worshiping community might have one book at their disposal as a source of worship. Um, so there's where we get this idea, and then we now have one. So let's, uh, canonical closure, and let me, let me conclude this way. I know I've, I've probably gone over time, have I? Oh, boy, sorry. Sorry, okay. Let me just uh, conclude. Maybe I shouldn't, uh, um, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll just uh, quickly conclude. Can you hang in there for a few minutes? Okay, okay. Um, we know from Josephus and various other sources that there came a time when prophecy was and divine insight ceased and the canon was viewed as closed. When this happened, no more books could be added, nor could editing continue. This would be a splendid opportunity for canonical editors to ensure the importance of all texts and draw attention to their importance as the Word of God. Um, I should have had my wife down there. It would have been, uh, uh, she would have got my attention, sorry. This would, have been, uh, this would have been a splendid opportunity for canonical editors to ensure the importance of all texts and draw attention to their importance as the Word of God. This is not without accident that if we look at one of the old arrangements, oldest of the arrangements of the canon, there are signals of this. Thus, at or near the beginning of each major section of the, these books, there is an ex, extraordinary importance to... Uh, so this, this is, these are the different documents. And so we have this... Uh, what I'm trying to do is try to stress how this is brought together. Um, 
We have seen that God creates the world with his word in Genesis 1, and he establishes the rhythm of the day and night. The next section, Joshua 1, is told to reflect on the Torah day and night and be successful. And in Psalm 1, near the beginning of the third section, we have the same command now given to every Israelite. That was the passage that John read. The word of God now demands patient study. And also, at the end of each of these major sections, there is an extraordinary emphasis on the Torah. So that we have in Deuteronomy 34, we're reminded of the unique contribution of Moses um, uh, and his words. There has been nothing like them. Then at the end of the prophets, Moses and the prophets are brought together with a reappearance of Moses and Elijah. Remember the Torah of Moses, prepare for the coming of Elijah. Now is the time to reflect and take heed not just to the Torah, but also to the Torah and prophets. Finally, at the end of the Chronicles, and this comes from Eric Zenger, the Old Testament scholar from Germany that, who's recently passed away, um, he mentions that you get all three at the end of Chronicles. You get uh, the reason for what has happened. Israel has uh, experienced an exile of 70 years, 70 Sabbaths. This comes from Leviticus chapter 26. It's also mentioned in Jeremiah. And also, it's, uh, we have it uh, in Daniel in the book of the writings. And so, it's, it's now to be understood. Um, so, uh, so, essentially, this is what we have and so this is canon two, and this is, we're closed. Okay, sorry. In the, in the meantime, Israel is to study and wait for the new act of God, but this is not a passive waiting. It's interesting that when Moses is describing the, what has happened at Sinai to the next generation, he takes pains to emphasize that the people did not see an image in the fire on the mountain representing any creature, uh, any creation, but they heard a speaking voice. The words of this voice were then transcribed, and Moses says to the people, you need to embody these and get them in your life. Um, so in a sense, what he's saying, get that fire into your life so that you can actually visibly represent God. This seems a long way from the beginning of this lecture, which stressed the idea of the Bible is illusory. Rather, as I have tried to stress, uh, that it was not just the smoking gun, but the smoking cannon of Judaism and Christianity. Without the Hebrew scriptures, it's not just possible to understand Judaism or Christianity. It, this, and this is, I think, one of the most important points to be made about the Old Testament for the Christian faith. <laughs> Case closed. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs>